We're getting closer to our revival series. Are you excited? I am. I'm looking forward to it. One of the most favorite things I like to do as a pastor is evangelism, reaching out uh, to people that don't know Jesus, uh, that want to make a commitment uh, to him and give their life. That's probably my favorite thing to do. I don't know what yours is in the church, but that's what I like. Uh, Not the only thing, but it is uh, one of my favorite things. And um, I'm looking forward to this. We had a meeting uh, earlier this week with the Stockton pastors. We're getting organized and uh, keep getting organized. And so we have a lot uh, that we're trying to do. And as you heard, we're meeting today at the Valley Community Church at 3 p.m. If you can make it for a training on retaining new members, you know what happens. It may have happened to you. Uh, You hear about the gospel. You give your life to Jesus. You start coming to church. But before you know it, you came in the front door. Which door did you leave? You left the back door. So this is talking about how to help people that give their lives to Christ, how to help them stay connected with Christ and stay in the church. And then at 4 o'clock, we're going to have a prayer session. And as a church, we all know about prayer, right? So one of the things that we're doing, we're helping with security, greeting. I'm helping with advertisement. We are also helping with prayer ministries, among other other things, uh, because for sure those are things that we uh, do here at the church. And I think uh, we have a great prayer ministry, among other things. So uh, Palicia and Joni are organizing a prayer team every night of the series. So if they call you and you're interested, please let them know. That means you'd get there a little bit early and pray. Or maybe uh, she'll be able to organize some people even in their homes when you can't make it. So this is great to be able to pool all of our resources together. And it's been also a pleasure to work with the other pastors. Today we're looking at Revelation 11. I'm sure that you have heard this before. You may have studied it, maybe even in depth. And uh, we're going to look at this, um, this prophecy uh, concerning the two witnesses. And as we do, I pray as we start that we will pray that God will inspire us with what this means for us today, not back uh, in history, but for us today, and how it can help us think through our role in these revival meetings. Amen? Amen. Let's take a moment of silence and let's ask God to prepare our hearts and minds to receive his word. Lord, we desire to give our hearts to you again. We want to make the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We not only want to confess it with our mouths, but we pray that Christ, through the indwelling spirit, would reside in the inner being. God, we desire today that you would come and that you would do an internal work inside and that you would send us out inspired with our role as members of your body in this upcoming revival series. Lord, I pray that you forgive us of any sins and cleanse us. We ask for the all-important gift of the Holy Spirit, that you would anoint us. I pray for myself that you would use me as a vessel to speak through. And I pray that as we look at this, um, this passage on the two witnesses, that you would inspire us. And we ask this, Lord, humbly, There's nothing that we have to present our case before you but Jesus and his righteousness. And it's in his name that we come boldly. Amen. When I am driving on the freeway, I pray for no AT&T. No accidents, no tickets, and no traffic. Yeah, anybody else pray for no AT&T? Yes. Although those things are sometimes avoided if we'll just drive a little slower, right? There are some things in life that unfortunately cannot be avoided because we live in a difficult, sinful, trying, rebellious, vengeful world. 
In this world, we're going to have accidents, not simply physical, but even spiritual, emotional, and mental. We're going to have tickets, uh, maybe not from a police officer, but maybe the ticket is that I dishonored God, that I broke his law, and I'm feeling the weight of the guilt on me. Maybe in this life, as I'm trying to move forward in my business or with my family or my finances or in my walk with the Lord, I find traffic. Where do we turn again and again? We turn to God, right? And we turn to God in his word especially. As we start to read those promises, maybe uh, someone shares something with you. You hear something. Doesn't it bolster your faith? When you're down and out and you're in that dark spot and doesn't seem to be anything to bring you out, it's that one verse or it's that one thought that God brings to you. Many times it's a, it's a scripture that he brings to our mind. And it has a power to revitalize us and keep us going forward, right? That's why you and I are here today, right? The Word of God has always been powerful, whether it was from the mouth of God in the beginning in the garden, whether it was through the mouth of his prophets, and especially through the mouth of Jesus. But today, although we don't speak to God face to face, although the prophet Elijah or Elisha is not with us, although Jesus is not here in the flesh, we still have the same Word of God as revealed where? In the scriptures, right? It's the power of God. And when we are open to God's leading, that same word has the same power and it produces the same effect in our life. In Revelation chapter 11, we are looking at these two witnesses and what takes place in this portion of the apocalypse. You have very likely heard evangelists or preachers Uh, describe what's going on in this chapter, maybe in detail. What I'd like to do today is focus on maybe some things that you haven't heard and look at some backgrounds on some of the spiritual spiritual backgrounds to what's taking place and what it means for us. Is that fair? So I won't cover everything, but I want to cover a few things from this chapter. Revelation 11, verse 1. This is uh, the revelation given to John the Apostle. Revelation 11, 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. If we go back to Ezekiel 40 or Zechariah 2, we find something similar with the measuring of the temple. And so this is a prophecy on although things don't look good for God's people and what's going on in the church, God is going to restore in the future. And then verse 2 says, But leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot. Doesn't sound good, right? Something bad, it's negative, but you may recognize what it says next. They'll tread the holy city underfoot for how long? 42 months. We're putting that up on the screen for for 42 months. Now verse 3 says, I will give power to who? My two witnesses, and they will prophesy how long? 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. If you have 30 days to a month, that's how they did it in the old days, 12 months a year. Uh, You have 42 months, that's 1,260 days if you do the math. Same time period. And so while God's people are being trampled, God has raised up his witnesses in the middle of it, although they're clothed in sackcloth, right? It's a time of mourning. It's a time of repentance. It's a time of difficulty. But God has raised up these two witnesses to do a work for him during a very difficult and trying time. Do you know that God still asks us to work for him in the middle of adversity, whether it's in our own life? or in somebody else's life. Many times it's in those difficult times that we actually help somebody else, even ourselves sometimes, have the greatest breakthroughs. So here are the two witnesses. They're given power to be God's witnesses, and they prophesy how long? 1,260 days. Now, I want to go quickly to Revelation 12, verse 6 and 14. I have it up on the screen. You can read it in your Bible if you want, Revelation 12, verse 6 and verse 14. And we're simply going to see that this, the 42 months, the 1260 days, is referred to in another way in the book of Revelation, also in the book of Daniel. Revelation 12, verse 6, uh, 12, verse 6 Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, 
that they should feed her there how long? 1,260 days. Same time prophecy as in the previous chapter in chapter 11. Okay, now Revelation 12 verse 14 talks about the same woman again. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time that is one year and times two year and half a time that's half a year from the presence of the serpent. If you take 42 months, if you take 1260 days and then you take the time times and half a time which is three and a half years. Does that all add up to be the same? 42 divided by 12. Help me out. Do the math on your phone. 1260 days divided by 360. It leads you with three and a half years. Okay, this, this is all the same time period. Time is a year. Times is two years. And half a time is half a year. These are all the same time periods. It's just said in different ways so that when we go to the study of the Bible, we really have to pull this stuff together to make sense out of it so that the average person reading it would not understand it and try to turn around and do some type of damage against the church and what God was prophesying. So if you really want to know the truth, you have to see, uh, search for it, right? But when you do, it doesn't take that much time as you start to compare the verses to make sense out of it. This is the time that the beast in Daniel, in the beast in Revelation, is warring against God and his people. But instead of looking at how this took place in history, the exact 1260 prophetic days, which was 1260 years, I want to do some background to this time because it's three and a half years. Can you think of any time in the history of God's people during three and a half years where they were dealing with apostasy? God's people were being persecuted and it was difficult to be a worshiper of God and to proclaim his word. Can you think of any time? The time that comes to my mind as I look at this and try to study some of the background is found in the story of Elijah. Do you remember that? Okay, Elijah prophesied that there would not be rain on the land of Israel for how long? Three and a half years. Why? Because there was an apostasy and it was a battle against the worshipers of Baal and Asherah versus God. And then there was the great shout, uh, showdown on Mount Carmel. Remember when God answered by fire and everybody then recognized that God, he's the real God. And then Elijah prayed and then God sent rain again. That was three and a half years. And this is described in James 5, 17 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He's cut from the same fabric as us, had the same temptations, the same lusts, the same battles, the same uh, uh, inner workings trying to lead him away from God. He had a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its This 1260 days, 42 months, time times, and half a time prophecy, the idea comes from the apostasy in the days of Elijah. As there was apostasy and persecution in the days of Elijah, God prophesied that in the future there would be a much bigger, larger, deeper uh, persecution against his people in his word. Now we're back in Revelation 11 and verse 3 again. And I will give power to my who? My two witnesses. We're going to start looking at these witnesses. There's different ways we could organize this. Hopefully the way I've organized it makes sense to you. God says they're my witnesses. What do God's witnesses do? They witness about Christ. Is that true? They witness about the power of the Holy Spirit, the word of God, what God sends them to do. Is that what we see his witnesses doing again and again in the scriptures? Amen. Yes, they witness about God, especially his word. I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the what? The two olive trees. Are both of these witnesses called olive trees? Yes. Okay, we're putting it up here so we can line it up and make sense out of the symbolism. An olive tree produces what? Come on. All, yeah, olives, and it produces oil, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so these witnesses have something to do with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
These are the two olive trees, and what else? And the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. They're both called lampstands. Do you remember what Psalm 119, 105 says? Your word is a lamp to my feet, yes, and a light to my path. Okay, this is talking to us about God's word, the sharing of his word, how it brings light and illumines our darkness. Verse 5, and if anyone wants to harm them, you've got to put your thinking caps on here for a second. This is going back to an Old Testament story. Uh, the book of Revelation is made up of all kinds of illusions, ideas, themes, stories from the Old Testament. It's all put together into one. So now we're going back to remember what it's talking about. Verse 5, and if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. If we read 2 Kings chapter 1, Elijah is there. And so the king sends a captain with his 50 to take Elijah. And Elijah says, if I'm a true prophet, then let fire come down out of God, from God out of heaven, and consume you and these men. And what happened? It did, and it happened another time. And the third time, the captain was smart. He's like, listen, man, (laughs) listen, just don't send down the fire. Just, you know, just work it out peaceably, okay? So when Elijah opened his mouth, God, in answer to his request, sent fire. Okay, so right away, we see that fire devours its enemies. This is bringing us back to a story of Elijah. Verse 6. Old Testament story again. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. Okay, who had power in the Old Testament to do this? Who did God give that power to? Elijah, okay? This first witness we could simply call Elijah. Read what it says next. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And what else? And they have power over waters to turn them to blood. Who did that in the Old Testament? Uh, Yes, Moses is in Exodus chapter 7, verse 17. Okay, so we're already thinking, hold on, this is a story from Moses. Then it says this, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Who was able to strike the earth with all the plagues? It was Moses. Okay, the second witness we can summarize as Moses. Now, what does all this mean? Luke 24 and 27. This is Jesus speaking. This is after his resurrection. It says this, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the what? The scriptures, the things concerning himself. So if the Jews wanted to refer back to the scriptures, they would simply say Moses and the prophets. Sometimes they would say Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, or Moses, the prophets, and the writings. The Hebrew scriptures today, that is what they are called. Uh, They are taken, it's called Tanakh. It's the Torah, the Nevi'im, which is the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which is the writings. They still divide it the same basic way today. So Jesus is referring to the scriptures when he says Moses, meaning the first Five books and the prophets, meaning the rest of the scriptures. And one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament was the prophet Elijah. Out of all the prophets, except for Enoch, right? That was before the flood. Out of everybody else, all the other prophets, there's only one that was translated without seeing death. And that was Elijah. Okay, so when we look at Revelation 11 and we're looking at these two witnesses and we're looking at the stories and what they represent, one is Elijah, one is is Moses. This is telling us that during this time where this beast power is trampling down Jerusalem, uh, wreaking havoc and persecuting God's people, he's warring also against the scriptures. But not only that, let me ask you a question. Is the the devil afraid of a Bible on a bookshelf? Is the devil afraid of leather or pleather with ink on paper? No, he's not worried about that. Does the devil even care if I read my Bible and keep everything I learned to myself? No. What the devil fears is if we will take the word of God to heart in our own life, which also includes sharing the good news with somebody else. When I do that, the devil's like, "Uh uh-uh. 
It's time to start to war. And so God raises up his prophets here represented, his people represented here as sharing God's word, either writing it, transcribing it, copying it, preaching it, teaching it, sharing books in any way they can. This doesn't simply represent the Bible because the Bible by itself is not a threat to the devil as long as nobody reads it and shares it. This is talking about the word of God as it is being shared by his people represented as Moses and Elijah, the scriptures shared, illumining the world. And they, God's people, are sharing his word in very difficult times. You think it's easier for us to share the word of God today or you think it's easier... For them to have shared the word of God back then under the persecution that they suffered. It was easier for, it's easier for us, but which one was more effective? Theirs was. Why? Because when it's very easy, we get into a very easy state. Because everything's easy. But when everything gets difficult, we have to decide what our priorities really are and whether or not we're really going to follow God or not because my head is at stake. And if my head is at stake and I still make a decision to follow God, then that means I'm going to be willing to share God even if my head comes off. Were there any people that were beheaded in the scriptures? Yeah, the apostle Paul. Was there anyone that was crucified? Yes, Jesus par excellence, and there's others. Was there anybody that was thrown into a cistern, sawn in half? Yeah, we read about these things in the Bible all throughout history, beginning with Abel, those who proclaimed God's word and lived according to it and wanted to share it with others were persecuted. Yeah, we got to join the club, right? It's much easier today to share God's word and just be laughed at, just be made fun of, be ostracized than it is to have somebody put a bullet in our head because we live in Saudi Arabia and there's no way you're going to bring a Bible over here. Is that true? Yes. These two witnesses represent the Bible and those who share it with others. In Matthew, Jesus says this in chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. The devil's not worried about salt in a shaker. He's worried about when we start to put that salt on somebody's plate. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. Does the devil care if I have the word of God, but I just keep it to myself? He doesn't care. You can read your Bible all day. He's not worried about it. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, right? This is sharing it with others in different ways, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What I do and what I say is what turns people on to Jesus. There's different ways that we are salt and light. There's different ways that we continue what the two witnesses are described as doing in Revelation 11. We give Bibles to those that don't have one. I gave a Bible um, last week to somebody that didn't have one. There's people in the city that don't have Bibles. Uh, we hand out Christian literature as uh, some of you do on a regular basis. We pray with people, don't we pray with people? Uh, we share Bible verses. Maybe it's by word. Maybe it's with a note. Maybe it's by a text. But we share the word of God with other people. We give Bible studies. We teach. We preach. We explain the Bible. This is what it means and many other things to be a witness, to take God's word and to let it shine forth. That the oil of the Holy Spirit may come from the olive tree onto somebody else. That that lampstand might illuminate somebody else's darkened situation. And you know what? If they read what the Word of God says, it is as certain for fire to come out of heaven and consume the enemies of Elijah as it is for what God's Word says for them. I may not need fire to come down out of heaven, right? Remember James and John, they were all upset that somebody, uh, that the, I think it was the Samaritans, they hadn't welcomed Jesus. And remember what they said? They said, do you want us to call down fire from heaven like Elijah did? And you remember what Jesus said? He says, you know not what spirit you are of. That means that whatever Elijah was doing and the spirit and the motivation that he had was not the spirit of James and John. 
James and John were also called the sons of thunder. <laughs> yeah. So it gives you an insight. They just want to knock these guys out. They couldn't stand them. It was in anger, but Elijah didn't do it in anger. Revelation 11, verse 7. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Doesn't sound good, right? Where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Imagine you're at work, and you're trying to live an upright life, and you're not going around with all the office politics and all the nonsense, and now when you get transferred to a different place or you leave for some reason, everybody's all happy. Yeah. Yeah. That's because they are no longer being faced with the fact that they're doing and saying things that are wrong. We don't have to even open our mouths, but sometimes people just don't like the way we live. Is that true? It's true. At uh, the urban camp meeting this summer, they had a number of the young people that uh, helped out with Youth Rush in Stockton. Youth Rush, they sell books, uh, Bibles, they minister to people, they go door to door, young kids uh, working here for a number of weeks. One of the young guys shared this amazing testimony. If you were there, you may remember. He said that he knocked on the door, and the gentleman opened the door, and he was in some type of an argument with somebody inside, and he didn't answer the door in such a friendly way. He left, and he was arguing with somebody, and he came back, and he started yelling at this kid, just about to yell at him again, and all of a sudden, he stopped. And he kind of had a look of awe about him. So the kid was, you know, telling him what he was there to do. And he's like, hey, hey, come here, come here. And he called his girlfriend over. You could tell he had been beating her up or whatever was going on. And so she was in awe too. And so he continued to talk. And I don't recall now if they bought or received any books or Bibles from him. But as he left, they were looking and they were still looking at him. And let me tell you what took place. Before he left, the guy says, who's that tall guy right there with you? Like, who's that tall guy? He's like, he's like, he's thinking like, it's like, it's just me. The guy's like, no. He's like, no, who's that guy with you? Okay, it's just me. He's like, no, 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 there's somebody there. And so when he leaves, they're still looking, and they're in awe. You know, they, no more yelling, no more fighting. They were just looking. And he knew, although he didn't see it, God sent an angel to protect him from a guy that started yelling at him, just may, may have gotten hostile with him. That guy stopped in his tracks, was in awe. And when this young man left, he says, from that time forward, he was like, I'm, it's on. I'm ready to get it. He wasn't afraid of any neighborhood, any person, because he knew God had his back. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So why are the two witnesses killed? Okay, it's the same reason why Jesus was killed. It's the same reason why the Apostle Paul and Peter and the rest of them were killed. It's the same reason why Abel and all the other prophets, many of them, killed, at least persecuted. Because the devil hates God and his people and he hates his word. Because when it is proclaimed and shared, it does something in people's lives, many times in the people that we would least expect. In John chapter 3, Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, and he says, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, right? He says, you don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know where it's going. And so all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit starts to blow on somebody, and you're just like, what? It's this wind that blows out of a direction that we wouldn't expect. It's not a north-south wind, something that we know. It's just a gust of wind, and it blows in an area that nobody would even think. And all of a sudden, the person that you would think never would give their life to Jesus, all of a sudden, something's happening in their life, and that person may very well be you. Maybe you never thought you would give your life to Jesus, just like I never thought I'd be a pastor, right? Yeah. The Holy Spirit starts to blow, and he wants to blow on us, but he blows not because of me, but he blows because of him, and he loves us, and he has a purpose and a plan for our life. That doesn't mean that you and I won't die. 
We all have an expiration date. Is that correct? We're all going to die in some way. Do you know that in the ancient world, when the, the soldiers were out at war, do you know that it was an honor to die in battle? It was a dishonor to turn your back for sure. It was a dishonor to desert. It was a dishonor to lose. But if you died in battle while wielding that sword for your country, it was an honor. It's still an honor today. Is that correct? Amen. Yes. We belong to an army more important than any U.S. military. We belong to an army more important than any ancient army. We have a battle that is much more important. It's worldwide. It's been being waged ever since sin. When we die in battle, wielding our sword, our spiritual gun, in fighting off not people, but in fighting the enemy, the Bible says that our warfare is a spiritual warfare, that we do not war against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Is that what your Bible says? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so when I come in to do battle, I'm not simply doing battle with the guy over there that's giving me looks. I'm doing battle with the person, uh, the being behind the guy that for the time being may have control of the guy. Amen. So I'm coming in and I'm praying, right? And so I am doing battle, spiritual battle. And if I die in my service to the Lord, I die with honor. Yes. I'm going to die somehow. If I die serving the Lord, swinging the sword of the spirit, that's a good way to die. Because I'm going to die anyway. Again and again, God's people have been slain. And these two witnesses are slain. Meaning God's people sharing his word. The, the devil was trying so hard to get rid of the scriptures and get rid of God's people. And he almost did. But now we have verse 11. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, the two witnesses. And they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. After how many days? Help me out. Three and a half. Okay. So help me. Help me now. One day, that's the first day. Two days, three days, and the half day happens on which day? On the fourth day. Okay. Which day are they resurrected on? It's the fourth day. Does it, re does it remind you of any other story of somebody being resurrected on the fourth day? Yes, Lazarus. Okay, so let's look at this real quick. John eleven thirty nine. 39. It's on the bottom of the screen. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench. Why? For he has been dead four days. After four days being dead, you're going to start decomposing. This is why Jesus waited. And he didn't go immediately when he found out that Lazarus was sick. And still alive. He was going to wait because he purposed by this miracle to reveal his power, not only uh, for his own resurrection to come, but everybody else's who he would, he, would, he would also call forth from the grave at his second coming. There was no way anyone could say that Lazarus was just sick and somehow he had slipped into a coma. Why? Because he was already decomposing. When we read in Revelation chapter 11 that these two witnesses have been dead and it's after three and a half days, this is on the fourth day. Uh, physically speaking, they would already be decomposing. Their death is certain. The, the, the devil's attack on God's people, the devil's attack on God's word was certain unless God intervened and did a miracle as great as resurrecting Lazarus. God had to intervene in order for his word and his people to come through. In the days of Noah, there was only eight that entered the ark. What if God had waited a couple more generations? How many people would have been left? And we can go through the stories and we can see that God has to intervene time and time again because by nature, this world and the humans in it, they want what the devil wants even though they don't want the devil. They still want what he wants. They just don't want him. Just like today, people still want what God wants. But in, in terms of a lot of things, right, they just don't want God. Amen. 
People want to do their own thing with whatever God has and with whatever the devil has. They just don't want either one in their life. But at some point, God or the devil comes into all of our lives. Verse 12, Revelation eleven twelve, And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. We have a background in the story to the days of Elijah, the apostasy in the days of Elijah, to the ministry of Elijah, as well as Moses. If we compare this story to what took place in Elijah's day, at the end of the three and a half years in Elijah's day, Elijah lives and the prophets of Baal are killed. However, in Revelation 11, at the end of the three and a half years, Elijah and Moses are killed and the wicked live. In Elijah's day, 7,000 of the faithful are preserved and lived. You remember that? God said, there, I have preserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee nor kissed uh, the foot of Baal. Isn't that what it says? In Elijah's day, 7,000 of the faithful are preserved and live. Revelation 11, 7,000 of the wicked are killed. However, in both stories, at the end, the wicked give glory to the God of heaven. Amen. Also, Moses wasn't killed in the Old Testament, but he was resurrected. Elijah wasn't killed, but he was translated. And both Moses and Elijah were taken up to heaven in, in, in the days of Jesus, right before he was going to the cross. Both Moses and Elijah came down from heaven on the Mount of Transfiguration to strengthen Jesus to go forward. Moses represented all those who would die and be resurrected at Christ's coming. Elijah represented all those who would still be alive when Christ comes and be translated without seeing death. They also represented Moses and Elijah, Moses and the prophets. Moses and Elijah represented the word of God. Everything that the word of God said about Christ, his coming, his power, his work, they were there representing the scripture and saying, Jesus, you got to go forward. You yourself spoke it in the Old Testament. They were encouraging him to do what the scriptures said. Amen. There are times in our life when we need to be reminded of the power of the scriptures, what God's word says, that we need to move forward in the face of opposition, that we need to look for light even in the middle of our darkness, that God comes in and he does something through his word that cannot be done in any other way. And whenever we start to not only read our Bibles, but when we start to not only even live in our own personal hideout secret place, but when we start to share with others by what we say and what we do from the word of God, all of a sudden the devil now starts to bring pressure and persecution in some way. But I still need to move forward because if I do, as they said, martyr's blood is seed. Meaning that as many Christians as they, as they would kill in the old days, many more would spring up. Whatever persecution you're going through because you're living by the word of God, whatever is coming against you because you're seeking to share the word of God with somebody else, move forward. It is an honor to die in battle. Amen. But I don't see anybody dead today, right? No. Our life in sharing the word of God is much easier. It is, there is a time that's going to be difficult. The Bible prophesies it. But for right now, it's a pretty easy road in the United States. We are gearing up to share the word of God with many different people in our community. And it is our responsibility to pray for who we're going to invite and invite them so that they can hear the word of God. And the devil won't want us to do it. Amen. He will bring every excuse, every distraction, and every persecution to keep us from inviting somebody and ministering to those that Christ has come to save. Amen. God has called you. To be his witnesses. Who will you share the good news with in your job, in your neighborhood, and now inviting them to be ready for this revival? October 12 is when it starts. Invite somebody, be the witness. It's the easy time. A storm's coming, right? 
We're not going through what the two witnesses went through during this time of persecution, the 1260 days. The people that were sharing God's word, copying it, writing it at the cost of their life. We may find opposition, but it is nothing in comparison, true? Move forward. Have boldness. Pray and think who you will minister to and invite. Amen? We're going to pause with a moment of silence for you to pray, for each one of us to pray and think, God, who are you calling me to minister to and invite to this series?